The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Welcome, everybody. It's, it's good to be here in the house of the Lord on a Sunday morning. Amen. And we welcome people online as well. We know we have people all over the world that, that tune in and, and watch us on the Internet. Um, one of the things that the Lord has been laying on my heart recently was um, kind of uh, what we've been going through on Tuesday nights. And we had a really great Tuesday night um, previously to this Sunday and uh, had Stina had mentioned a true north and and being taken to true north and I, I really feel that that's part of that's part of God's plan right now what does that mean for us though um, a lot <laughs> one of the things that I was I was talking to one uh, uh, one of the folks this morning um, and he had mentioned a story about uh, Bobby Connor and, and what's up and uh, what's really neat about that is, I don't know if you, if you knew, but John Wesley kind of coined a phrase, a question that he asked everybody that he would come across. And um, it was called, how is it with your soul? He would say, how is it with your soul? And see, the response to that question would give him and whoever their leaders were an indication of, of where you're at. Because how you answer it um, because you can answer it with depth or shallowness you could answer it with integrity my soul is hurting right now or I you know I feel such and such or and and really and it shows the connection between you and the person that's asking the question so the depth of their relationship there as well um, along with the depth and the relationship with God so it so he learned a lot by your response just from that one little question. Um, and that's where we're at today. How is it with your soul today? I feel that the, the Lord wants us to develop depth and intimacy in our relationship. Um, but we have to first come back. And uh, out of all the distractions and busyness uh, of our lives, we, we tend to veer off center, off focus. Our center should be Christ, amen, as, as believers. I came across a, a, a quote that I thought was really neat and it really kind of should be stamped on all the products in our ministry, but it's probably a copyright infringement. Uh, it is astonishing how many difficulties clear up without any effort when the inner life gets straightened out. And that's by A.W. Tozer. But I think it should be on everything <laughs> we have. Um, in John fourteen twenty one, it says, Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them. And I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. When you, when you build depth in a relationship, you have to have presence. You have to be present with that person. You have to be present with God in the same respects. You have to make time to be in his presence in order to know him, right? But like I said, I feel that, that the Lord is bringing our congregation and, and this time is, is really timely now that we're pointed in the direction of, of Christ, the center. We're taking out and removing some of the, the stuff that helps us uh, not helps us, but guides us in the wrong direction, so to speak. Um, I'm going to be talking about a little bit of those things that hinder, that can hinder depth and intimacy and relationship with the Lord this morning. And then I'll tell you what we need to do to fix that. Some of it's self-explanatory, but anyway. A self-check on how is it with my soul, or what's up <laughs> with your soul. A self-check would be, 
Number one, well, first of all, a lot of depth and, and intimacy in relationship, um, it all starts with the fear of the Lord. Um, that kind of encompasses this whole thing. If, if you lack the fear of the Lord, you don't take him seriously, then the rest of the stuff isn't, isn't going to be real fitting anyway. So it, it all has to start with a, a fear of the Lord, of not, not just being afraid of him, but being afraid of being absent from him. Um, taking him seriously, in other words, at his word. But number one, under the fear of the Lord, of course, it would be your comfort level. You may not even be aware that there's a possibility. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that, that, that don't have the depth that our church teaches, even. And they have no idea that there can be. You know, they go to church to, um, like, a pick-me-up or the next, you know, three steps to a happier life um, or what have you. But, but we teach depth here. We teach intimacy and relationship over all. Um, it's no excuse anymore because if you're not aware, I'm telling you that you should be. <laughs> you are now aware. <laughs> so, oh well. Um, if you don't lack the knowledge, you could ask the Lord. And he is free to give that to you. You can't, you can't use excuses that no one told you now, this is what I'm saying. Um, what's really neat was, it, was I was reading a story earlier um, while I was preparing the message, and it was a story about a young couple in the early 80s who had gotten a, a, a fixer-upper, a home, um, when they first got married, and they moved in and had a lot of work to do. And... Um, they actually ended up staying there a little bit, you know, fixing a little bit here and there and stayed there for decades, right? Raised their kids there and everything. Um, but one of the things that they they never even really noticed um, until they had their hot water heater replaced was that their, their, they had really low pressure in their water system, hardly anything. So they, they taught themselves in order to take a shower uh, you can't flush any toilets, you can't run any sinks, you can't do anything outside. You take a shower and that's it. That's the only running water in the house. Um, otherwise, you get, you know, frozen or, or baked, uh, steamed, uh, what have you. And, but they learned to live with this for 30 years. They raised their kids with the low water pressure. They, they, they learned to adapt in that comfort level, right? That is where they would be really not aware of their possibility of being more or being depth. So they dug up their front yard when they were, replaced the hot water tank and nothing. And, and the guy that was replacing the tank said that you hardly have any water pressure at all. You know, people across the street are fine. Well, what's the matter here? We got to get this checked out. And so they end up digging their whole front yard up. Uh, the city replaced 100 feet of a line to their to their house. They got to the front of the house and there was just enough for about a, a nail hole of water. The guy was like, I'm surprised that you had any water at all, all these years. Um, but the thing is, is what, I, what I'm trying to say is they, they had no idea that there could be more or better. Of course, when they turned on the, the at full pressure, some of the things in their house, like their, they had a little boiler, an old fashioned boiler downstairs that blew up because of the water pressure was too great. Um, but so they had to make adjustments afterwards, but it was, to them, it was like heaven when it came, when all this water pressure, it was like, they could do, they could flush the toilet, they could, you know, clean something in the sink and they could run the, the dishwasher at the same time. It's great. Um, but you might not be aware. So now you are, that there is a possibility of depth. In fact, that's the reason why he sent his son, so that we could have fellowship again once again with him. Under the comfort level, you're either not aware or you lack vulnerability for whatever reason. If depth makes you feel uncomfortable, it does make people uncomfortable. Why do I have to be depth, you know, have depth? Why do I have to talk to other people? Why do I have to have those strong relationships with others? You know, why? It, it, it's, it, it feels very uncomfortable to me. 
Well, you know what? God knows what you look like naked, so deal with it. He, you know, Adam and Eve tried to hide, and that didn't work out too well for them. But you can't hide from God. God knows everything. He knows how, in, you know, your integrity, your, what you do outside of the limelight, what you do at home in your own, you know, in your own space. Um, and he's always with you. Why not have that relationship be the one that you're vulnerable to? He never did, he never did anything wrong. He never will do anything wrong. He never lies to you. I mean, if anything, the most vulnerable that you could ever be is with God, your maker, your creator that knows everything about you already. I mean, what are you afraid of? It's possible to be vulnerable with God just that way, and it increases your depth in your relationship with him. When we first asked Christ into our hearts, we, were made, we made ourselves vulnerable. We opened up our heart. We took down the barriers. We allowed him to come in. And, and it says in scriptures, now walk in it. Just as you've received him, you walk it out. And you have to remain vulnerable in your relationship so that you could hear and that you could see and that you could flow in what, what, what he's doing in your life and what he wants for you. Some people are comfortable being shallow. And I'm saying that because there are a lot of people that are just, they're just, they just have a lukewarm attitude. They're comfortable being shallow. They don't, they don't need any, they don't want or need anything else. They, they, they feel that depth takes too much work and effort and healing that takes place that, that you need to do in order to, to, to um, abide and to remain in depth with, with the Lord and his intimacy with him is too much to do. It's just too much. I want to remain shallow. You know, high and by at church and, and, you know, let's go to church, tickle your ears and then go home instead of really living out the transformed life inside. And some people like that. But you're not going to ever have depth and intimacy in what, what really God's called you to, to do in life. Um, so one is the comfort level and all those different things that you're, you, could, you could have. Second is your desires. We need to keep that in check, that self-check, your desires. And a lot of, uh, a lot of the things that happen in the, in, the, in the wilderness with the children of Israel um, could be referenced through that as well. Um, but desiring God's benefits or blessings over desiring to know him in his presence. Um, kind of like he'd be like the, the, the big vending machine in the sky, so to speak. I, and and not, not bad. I mean, some of the things that we ask for, of course, are not bad. Some of the things are not bad for us. Some of the things that we're asking for are legitimate needs to be met, you know, but if you place that desire over relationship, if you place that priority of, of that answers to your prayers or answers to your problems over that relationship, the desiring to be with him, then, then you're, you're kind of going off center. Amen? It reminds me of the, the story in John 6, 22, um, where... Jesus had uh, just broke the bread and fed everybody, and then he decided to go across the lake, or the you know the sea. I can't remember which what it was the sea, right? <laughs> Let's just read it in, in in chapter six, verse twenty-two, starting. The next day, and that's John, John six twenty-two. The next day, the crowd that still remained standing on the other side of the sea, realized that there had been only one small boat there and that Jesus had not gone into the, you know, into that boat with the disciples, that he went away by himself and they went away by themselves. But now some of the other boats from Tiberias came in a near a place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. So the people finding that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the small boats and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the lake, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? 
And Jesus answered them, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, you have been searching for me, but not because you saw the miracles and signs that point to him, but because you were fed with the loaves and filled, with the sat and, filled and satisfied. It's when you desire the benefits over the relationship and really knowing him. They didn't want to know him. They just want their bellies filled at that point. And he discerned that because that's what he, that he was God. Anytime you desire benefits or blessings over relationship, you can easily be misled. In fact, no matter what you choose over intimacy with God, you will invite unnecessary turmoil and trials in your, in your life. No matter, no matter what you choose over intimacy, if you choose to be comfortable in your shallowness, you're actually inviting trials and tribulation and turmoil into your life that you wouldn't have normally had. You wouldn't have had extra. Yay. <laughs> we, need, we all need extra trials and turmoil in our life, right? Just because we want what, I, what we want. Number three, we need to clarify our agendas. Why do you do the things you do? Who do you do them for? Under agendas, you could have a cause. But I tell you what, without humility and true intimacy with God, you can easily still, easily be misled. You could be bound to a cause rather than being bound by the love of the Father. So you have to be careful. It could be a good cause. But if it doesn't have the love of the Father first and primary, if you're not Jesus-centered and focused on relationship with Him, then your cause will lead you astray. It could even be a ministry. Sometimes self is magnified over God, even if it's in reference to a seemingly selfless, noble, or loving aspiration. A hug, for example. Try that in a public grocery store. <laughs> just hug some random people. Well, you feel like it's your ministry. Just start hugging people and see what their reactions are. And you're lucky. You, you, nowadays, you might get punched. I, I, I'm afraid of that for, with my kids because all of them want to just go and hug everybody and tell them that they love them and that they're their friends and. And, and, and at random times and random places, it's, it's actually pretty awesome right now. But, but, if it, but I mean, really, if you are askew even in your noble cause or noble deed or noble ministry to help others, if you're focused on that ministry over focused on relationship, it's not going to be acceptable to a lot of people. You're going to be held back. And that's the next thing. The way that you can check yourself is you have feelings of you're either getting tired of, of constantly being blocked, snuffed, not enough money, not enough time, not enough to get my goals reached or to get my cause fulfilled and heard or to get my ministry off the ground or to get, you know, it could even be a, a God-given dream or prophetic promise. If we hold on to the dream or the prophetic promise over relationship, we still can go. But again, if you want to check yourself to make sure that you're okay, you might find yourself... Uh, like lacking the time, lacking the finances, lacking the money, everything's holding me back, somebody isn't letting me do it, I don't have the right space, I don't have this and that, you know, something is keeping you from X, Y, Z. You might be chasing the dream instead of chasing God. In fact, that was one of the funny things that I, I did when I first got here, my dating philosophy changed. 
as I'm, I'm learning to, to develop that, at that time, I was learning to develop that relationship and that depth and the intimacy with God and being alone by myself, you know, and praying with Him. And there was times, there was, it was so awesome that I would be sitting at my table and I would feel that, that Jesus was right across the table with my hands as we prayed through the 60-day challenge together. Good times, by the way. <laughs> uh, but you know, my dating philosophy at the time was chase after God, and if somebody can keep up with you, introduce yourself. But that should be your goal, your relationship with God. It has to, everything that you, that, that you do and, and everything that, that flo everything flows from that, it should. Otherwise, it's dead works. Number four, after we did agendas, number four would be affections. Your affections are basically your attentions, the things that, that grab your attention a lot, or your work, in other words, your worship, right? That reminded me of Leah's story in, in Genesis 29. Leah was Jacob's first wife, and I know I, I talked about that a little, little while ago. Um, but in Genesis 29 was a story of Leah, and it, and, it, and it says, And the Lord saw Leah, and that she was hated, and he, and he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Rachel was Jacob's first choice, and he was kind of snuckered into uh, Mary and Leah first. He worked seven years to get Rachel, but Laban, his uncle, gave Leah first. And it was it was like on his wedding bed night. It was so he was very upset about that. But in but uh, as I read the story, I'll I'll explain a little bit better what happened. In verse thirty-two, it says, "And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, and for and now my husband will love me." You see, she always wanted the the, the affections of Jacob. She wanted to be looked at like he looked at Rachel. And she wanted to have, you know, um, to be a good wife to him and bear him sons. And, and God did open her womb like this and, and let her um, bear him many sons. And it was all God's plan. She conceived again and bare another son. And because the Lord has heard that I'm, I'm hated, him, he therefore gave me another son and called his name Simeon. And then she conceived another son and said, Now this time my husband will join, be joined unto me because I have borne him three sons. He's, she's like, Now, I mean, for sure he's going to love me. And her focus was on trying to get him, trying to, to snatch his attention, to grab his affections. That's all her focus was. But then in verse 35, she conceived once again and bore a son. And she said, this time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah, and she left off bearing from there. But when she said, this time I will praise the Lord, it was a shift of affections. It was a shift of her attention, a shift of her worship. It, it took self out of it and said, I really want his affections. And, she, and just put that aside and said, God, I, I'm remembering you. Um, you know, Leah's role as a wife was one that tended to her husband. She desperately tried to crack, you know, capture his heart. The plan of God unfolded before her when she chose in her heart to bless the Lord. And then Judah was born, which means praise. In Leah's story, we can be encouraged that a transformed life cannot occur in a perfect spouse or an abundance of children, but with a heart that's tender and vulnerable and surrendered to God. Amen. Let me assure you, just as Leah did, it was a, with the names of her children, which I thought was, was so cool, the way that she saw things, was that she was seen, she was heard, and she desired that bond. 
And that's just how God works, right? It's like how he works. Leah chose to praise God and be thankful for God's role in her life. This level of praise, of course, it ended up Judah in the line of our Christ and Savior. We give thanks for who God is and not just what he's done. And it's not based on our current circumstances. Reordering our affections will begin to open us up to a life of transformation. Make open-handedness a priority. Hold things lightly that you've been given. Not with a, a death grip, right? We're, we're meant to be stewards over what God's given us. Let's hold them lightly. If at all. Sometimes we've got to let things go completely. And that's called stewardship. In fact, it's called not caring less. Some people consider that, oh, that's, that's careless or caring less. But I think, in, in more appropriately speaking, it is. It's caring more appropriately. So in review, the things that hinder intimacy under the, the, the umbrella of the fear of the Lord, your comfort level, whether you're unaware of being, you know, there being more in relationships or your, your lack of vulnerability, or you just might be comfortable in your shallowness, your comfort level, your desires. Make sure you're not desiring his benefits, his blessings, and his, even his answers to your problems over relationship with him. Careful about that. Your agendas. Do you have a cause, even a ministry, or a God-given dream, or a prophetic promise that you're chasing after instead of his presence? Your affections and your worship, as we just talked about with Leah. So what is the answer? What's the answer to this? If you don't have depth, but now you're like, oh, I, I, there, there's a possibility and I do do some of those things. And I receive forgiveness, first of all. You receive forgiveness for doing those things. Because anything that is not Christ-centered is self-centered. Oh. <laughs> Ouch, right? The answer is that we need to train ourselves and learn to practice a preference for God. Practice a preference for God. You could be, you know, I think Dad and Jennifer gave me a partial list, but and the list could go on. You could be salvation-centered, sanctification-centered, doctrine-centered, experience-centered. A lot of people are experience-centered. That's not cool. Spirit or gift-centered. That's not cool either, but it's seen a lot these, you know, around here in the church, unfortunately. You could even be message-centered. Um, you could be children-centered. You could be family-centered. Anything that takes your, moves you out of where God has wants you to be. If you if you are, if you are not Christ-centered, like I said, you're self-centered. Those are things that you chose. And if you if you're anywhere out of there. What time? What, what happens when um, ultimately self is raised up? Besides, you know, pride and all that. Ultimately, I mean, we could look at the children of Israel and again. In reference, uh, any time that self is the focus, complaining is inevitable. Are you complaining? You find yourself complaining a lot to yourself or to God. Hmm. Maybe you want to see His perspective on where you're at. You might want to check that first. But anytime the focus is self, there's it's going to be complaining. And the several deadly seas on the on the if we could ever find that teaching, it was really great. But the way that we learn to deal with those things is to practice a preference for God. It brought me to a point where I was looking at Exodus 
chapter 33, verse 13 through 15. It says, now, therefore, I pray, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways that I may know you, so that I might find favor in your sight. Now, this is Moses. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. And then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, don't lead us up from here. What? Why? Because Moses understood that presence was most important over all. His presence, his relationship, his intimacy with God, having God be near was the most important thing. It is it's just one thing, just like our, the song was, was saying. That one thing, I desire Jesus, give me Jesus. Nothing else will do. No other person will satisfy just give me Jesus. And that's that relationship. It's not learning about. We could, we could spend all our time learning about Jesus. We could, we could write books on learning about Jesus. We could read our, you know, we could memorize scripture. We could be a Bible scholar and have no relationship with him. All those things that, 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 that Jesus did and said and, and his presence that, that came with him even when he was here on his earth walk was to restore the fellowship between him and the people of God. We need relationship. We need intimacy. It's so vital to our, our walk with him that Let me know your ways, reminding me also of Philippians 3.10. Because in the same ways, it was, let me be more intimately acquainted with him, understanding the remarkable wonders of his person more completely. It's the same, it's the same let me know. I want to know everything about him. I want to know all about you. I want to, I want to be, it has to be our heart's cry right now. It's one of those things, like I said, it's what God wants for the church. It's what, what, what God wants for us personally between him and between in our own relationships, personal relationships with him. It's what he wants in our families. I got convicted a little bit because I was, when I was studying for this, you know, we're really, we've been looking for a house for probably two or three years now. And, and one of the things that when the Lord was speaking to me about this teaching was our, you know, because he told me, he told, he told Gwen and I that we need to move. I said, great. And so we start looking for houses. We start looking at floor plans. We start looking, you know, at price ranges and, and all the things that we, were, we, we needed to do, um, you know, getting pre-qualified for loans and, 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 you know, specifying areas of where we want to be in Fort Mill and, and not in North Carolina and this and that and all these specifics. But what I did was I, we, we, we were like, God says this, so we got to do it. I, I needed to repent because it was like I had, my goal should have been to continue in seeking him. Not that he would change his mind or anything like that, but my goal is to know him so that when he's ready to move us, we would be able to flow with that and that we would be like, this is the time and this is the house. So I can't wait now because, I mean, most every message that I, that I take up here that I teach you guys is because it's out of a conviction <laughs> that God that God prompted in my heart that needs changed. Just an FYI, <laughs> but this but that is that's but that was the one thing. And you know what? There's so many. It's so easy to get distracted. It's so many. There's so many different things. There's 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 technologies and things. You know what? When you're when you're really wanting to be in somebody's presence and develop that intimacy with them. Um, whether it's just a good friend or somebody that you need to catch up with over the years, or put the technology aside and, and put stuff that can 
interfere in the, in the atmosphere. Don't take them to, to a place where there's like loud music. You know, really sit and learn to be a good listener and, and communicator with them. It, it, it's honoring the other person and God. Um, at the same, in the same respects, you need to do that with God in your own prayer time. Make sure you set yourself, you know, to, in a place where that you, you, can, you can quiet your flesh. Our flesh is the, the most, the, the loudest thing that we have. And, and since COVID, my ears have been ringing so loud, I can't, it feels like I can't hear God, <laughs> let alone my wife and my kids sometimes. But, I mean, it's a, it'll go away, I'm sure, in Jesus' name. But, it, but the thing is, is like we need to separate ourselves and give, a, and give God time in order to speak to us. We need to learn to look for Him and notice Him in everything. Um, and, and, and really ask Him to develop that in our hearts, that, that mindset of, Lord, I just want to know You. I want to I be intimately acquainted with my Maker and the person that wrote this Bible, all these words were for me before I even existed, and he knew me. But he wrote all this for me. He knew what I would be going through. He knew the wilderness times that I would be spending going in circles. And he knew when I'd be running home to him while he was waiting on the front porch looking out at the field. He knows us and wants that intimate relationship more than anything with us. Paul understood that abiding required less and less of the self-life, the flesh and all its entanglements and distractions. Dad and Jennifer came across this quote by Deverne Fomke that I thought was amazing and very fitting for what I really wanted to get across this morning. He says, now all of this has been leading to this one thing. If God could have his full way with us, he would take us immediately past all the off-centered wanderings to the center which our Father had given us, Christ himself. This is not more learning about Christ, like I said, but learning Christ if all things to make plain and clear, I've found this point to be one of the most difficult. It is because the majority have become so preoccupied with mere things and technologies and their own children and families and, oh, there's so many things that they've missed Christ altogether. We could take up everything there is about Christ as doctrine, as teaching, but that is not what we're here at. That's not what we're here after. God would center us in Christ himself. He himself is the living embodiment and personification of all truth, of all life. And the Lord's purpose and will for us is not to come to know the truth and its manifold aspects, but to know the person in a living way. Now, I... I I thought it was interesting when I when I when I opened with the scripture in John 14 21 those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me and because they love me my father will love them and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them when you look at that scripture and I have in the past I looked at it through a legalistic view say, of if I do everything in the Bible that's right, if I do right, then Jesus will know that I love him. And some people still believe that, and they get really tired doing all the right things. And in fact, they can't do them all. You know why? Well, look at the children of Israel again. The children, in, in when they were, they were come out of Egypt, they said, to, you know, they wanted answers to their problems. And it's the same as what I, you know, they, they were seeking answers to their problems. So what did Moses do? Oh, you, I, you know, we can't go up there. you got to talk to them. They were, if we go up there, we're going to die. We, we're, we're so screwed up that we can't face God on our own. So 
Well, let's send Moses up. And he brings down the Ten Commandments because that in, a, in and of themselves would have fixed most of their problems. But what happened over generation and over generation is they, they found out that they can't follow those Ten Commandments. Without relationship and without the grace of God, you can't do it. You just can't do the Bible. You can't live the Christian life without intimacy with God, without His ever-loving grace and mercies, without the real relationship. You can't do everything that, he needs, that, that's, that we're supposed to. So in the legalistic way, how should I look at it then? Legalistic says, I, I have to do everything, and then he knows I love him. Well, Jesus already knows that you love him. He doesn't have to have you do something in order to do that. So what's he saying here? If you love me, then you do those things. Those are the ones I know that they, 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 they're in their hearts of, heart of hearts, that they love me and what they do comes out of that love for me. It's not the other way around. I'm not trying to prove to Jesus that I love him by doing. I am doing because I love him. Amen? What's really neat about that situation is when everything flows from the heart, flows from that love, that reciprocation back to him, he will love, it says, my father will love them and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. My revelation of, what is revelation of himself? His, his revelation of himself is his relationship, his, his divine nature, his, his intimacy, that, that bond that he wants to grow with us. It's that revelation of him and his presence. And his presence is what? His presence is transformational. When Jesus was here as an earthwalk, people were transformed. He died and rose again, and we still go after him daily, I hope, in, in our prayer times and say, Lord, there's, there's something in me that needs dealt with, something in me that's coming between you and I. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to grieve your spirit. I don't want to quench the spirit. Is there anything there? Because if there is, Lord, I want to deal with it now. And I receive forgiveness for having that there. And I let you cleanse it out. Wash me. I keep, I keep thinking of uh, Isaiah when, when he was, you know, it was like before the Lord and the angel touched his lip. It's like, I'm a man of unclean lips. But we need to live a life of repentance, forgiveness. We need to allow forgiveness to flow in and out. And through, we need to live a life of constant repentance and forgiveness, like a cycle. And then we start, that'll develop, that's what develops the intimacy, that's what develops your relationship. You just need to ask, is this, is this, is this all right, Lord? You know, what's, what's interesting about discernment is it's not only, and I, and I think, I'm not changing subjects, so just hear me out. Discernment is, while it's all about the fear of the Lord, just like what we were talking about earlier, and taking Him seriously, but it's, it's intentionally quieting our flesh. It's intentionally noticing our intimately loving God who has a relentless love towards us in everything. It's noticing him in everything by quieting our flesh. It's then in that noticing, it's showing gratitude for his abiding presence and his unconditional relentless love. I love when you go through the scriptures and you read how David ministered to God when he was alone. And he ministered to God. He's just like, you are, God, you are my God. You are everything. You are my all in all. I, like my body even craves, my physical body craves the, the anointing and the, and the presence of God. I want, to, I want to have that as well. I want you to have that as well. 
we need to get to a point, and I know that God is doing this. It's, it's like a prophetic thing. God is, is pointing us true north, and we need to stick to it. We need to keep Jesus as a focus in the relationship building with him, not the stuff that's going on around us, not our things. Some things are important to deal with, but, but seek him and relationship with him and intimacy with him, and all these things will be added unto us. If we would just search for him with all our heart. In Psalm 63, David says, O God, you are my God. With deepest longing I will seek you. My soul, my life, my very self thirsts for you. My flesh longs and sighs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. And that's Psalm 63 at the beginning. I want, I want to be able to take that and everything that, that, that we, we talked about, the hindrances too, I want to make sure that we don't have any of those things. I want to wake up in the morning and feel clean and refreshed and not heavy and laden, burdened down by things that aren't happening the way that I want them to or they didn't work out the way that I plan or, you know, things that came up that surprised me that I don't have the finances for or things, you know, all these things that are easily distracted along with the fact that we already have our own preferences in what, what we want to do for God, what, you know, if we were called to be an evangelist or if we were called to be a, 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 an anointed speaker and God promised us that we would be able to uh, save thousands of people, get thousands of people saved um, in, our, in, our, in our ministry, if we are ministry focused, if we are anything focused other than that relationship with Jesus, the real, the truth, the life, if we are focused on anything but, we are self-centered and we need to stop. <laughs> it's killing our depth, <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> we have some really wonderful um, home groups that teach depth. We are, a, we, we are open and vulnerable to God first, and then we're open and vulnerable to others, and we allow that interaction to take place because that's how God wanted it. That's how God originally planned it. That's how God designed it and gave us the, the ability to do it by His grace. We are, we are, we are God-focused and able to minister to others and have others minister to us. That's the way it's supposed to be. We can't live, of course, we can't live just me and God, me and God, and I'm going to be in my prayer closet for the next eight hours, and I'm going to ignore my wife and children. Um, you know, we, we can't do that to that extreme. We're meant for, for each other, you know. Um, but, I, but I think, I hope, I hope some of that resonates with you today. Um, I hope there's some, a little bit of conviction there because I was convicted myself on some of it. And I don't want to be the only one, but if I am, allow God to work in me. I, I do. Desperately try to capture God's heart. Desperately try to capture His heart. Be pleasing to the Father. You know, I, like Nehemiah in the wall, in, 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 in Nehemiah, everything that he did in, in building the wall and all the people that would come up against him and rose up against him and were so nasty to him to try to get him to stop, he only wanted to please the Father. His main goal was to please, to be pleasing to him so that the Lord would delight in him. You know, the, the, what's really neat is like when, when you look at the love of the Father, it's relentless. It's, it's, it, you can't do anything to be loved less, right? It's there. It's always there. It's, like, he, like he says, it's unconditional. It's relentless. He's, oh, it's always there. His presence, however, is not always there. I mean, he is there, but your your feeling of his presence can be blocked by a lot any sin and, and and what have you. But you know what's interesting is when when you when you when you really get into 
the, the nitty gritty of the relationship. You want to you want to be the delight of his heart, and that delight doesn't start with him. It it starts with your obedience to to him and and your knowledge of him and your intimacy. So just like when he was building the wall, it's like I want to I want to be a delight to the Father. I want to be a delight to him. I don't want to do anything, of course. I don't want to do anything that would that would cause him grief, that would quench the Holy Spirit. You know, all those things. But I really want to be a delight. Don't you? Run the run the run the race that was put before me. Finish the good fight. Fight the good fight. Finish the race. I said it backwards. But it's but it's still. I want to be a sweet psalmist. Like David said, he was a sweet psalmist. He could have said anything. He could have said awesome, powerful, you know, leader of, of men and king. And he said, I'm just a sweet psalmist. I just wanted to be able to praise the Lord and be a, be a blessing to, to God. A sweet fragrance to him so that he would be delighted in my life and what he gave me. Amen. We thank you, Father, for this some of the wonderful instruction that you've placed before us, and we thank you, Father, for your grace that we were able to do that. We ask you, Father, right now that you would teach us to notice you in everything. Teach us to notice you more. Teach us how to quiet our flesh. Give us the grace and mercy to quiet our flesh before you in prayer, in our prayer times. When we're alone in our in our prayer closets, Father, that 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 we would get more accustomed to your voice to what we hear, to what we see. We thank you, Father, for developing a, in us a, a heart that is vulnerable, that is soft. If there's any hard areas in our, in our, in our hearts where we've hardened our will, or please, Father, just break up that ground right now. And we, just, we just ask you to soften that that part of our life. And we just ask you and we, 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 we voluntarily allow you to come in right now to those areas and shine your flashlight on those things. Lord, we're, we, we may not feel like we're ready to see some of those things, but Lord, I don't want anything in there that will come between you and I. Nothing at all. I want your presence more than anything. I want your life more than anything. The one that you have for us. Nothing in this world is worth it. Nothing in this world can can even compare to you, Father God. And we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.